Well, good morning. And welcome to um, the Monarch Research Event Center. I'm sorry that uh, you're not here in person, but uh, we all know that there's been some distractions that uh, have not allowed us to do it here at the station. But let me explain that it is beautiful out here and we're gonna be through this session in about 45 minutes. So it's gonna be a little faster than if you had to actually come out uh, to the station and uh, be with us. So uh, first of all, I wanna thank all of you. This is, this is Memorial Day weekend, Saturday, and you've taken the time to uh, join in uh, with this session. And so I'm probably preaching a little bit to the choir, to begin with here, um, and that's fine because we need a planting forward force that can, can bring others in to this movement. So I, I only wanna spend a second on the virus situation because we're all tired of it, uh, but oh, the lessons that, the lessons that are learned in situations like this. And I don't wanna downplay this. I mean, uh, we've lost uh, thousands of lives. So I don't wanna downplay this in any way, but there are some real lessons and they pertain to what we're gonna talk about today. And, and the lesson is that, uh, well, first of all, a virus spread is local. And so the, where we solve it is locally. And I know all of us are pointing fingers and we're saying, when we're gonna get the vaccine, when are we gonna get the silver bullet here and there and the other thing. But the vaccine can, can maybe partially protect us. They're not usually 100% anyway. Uh, so we need to take the responsibility. Us, we need to take the responsibility to not allow the virus to spread. The virus has to be in a human being to spread to another human being. So we know how to stop that. We know that we put a mask on and we wear gloves when we're touching things and we stay away from people, ah, no problem. If 50% of the citizens in Lynn County decided to wear masks when they were in public and distance themselves, and use hand sanitizer, uh, the virus would be gone in three months from Lynn County, with the exception of a few interlopers coming into the county. So we can solve the virus problem ourselves, and we need to. So it's local, and our environmental issues are local. Government's not gonna solve it for us, if anything, <laughs> It causes more harm than good. We are going to solve our environmental issues. Okay? Depend on ourselves. Look at ourselves first when it comes to creating solutions to problems. So that's enough on the coronavirus. Uh, I'm ready uh, to move forward past that because the environmental issues are so much more deadly than the virus. They're coming slowly to us, and that makes the action uh, less urgent. We have to raise the urgency. So let's get after it. I need to be ready to take action. So let's see here. Now realize I'm here by myself. And so everything won't necessarily be done perfectly. Don't expect it. I don't use notes or read scripts. So you get what you get. Planting forward. Okay, this picture. Burn this picture into your mind. Uh, it's native plants native flowers, native grasses, native trees, and the sun. This picture is the total picture 
of the, the engine that drives life on our planet. Humans don't. No, this is what drives life on our planet. And without it, well, you know what the alternative is without it. So uh, as we think about this, we know this is where we have to get back to. We've lost much of this. And so this whole series is about bringing nature back to our land. The land that's available needs to be restored. So in doing that, the Monarch Research Project is really going to provide a roadmap for everyone. And it starts with today's presentation. And I'm not going to soft pedal it. It is a critical need. It's more uh, demanding than the coronavirus, believe me, by an order of magnitude. That's what I want to get across today. But I also want to get across the fact that it's very fixable. So as we move to next week's presentation, which will be, well, the talent there is better than this week's talent. Uh, Jim Hoffman will be handling, well, it'll, you'll be ready to get started next week. What do I do to participate in this movement that Monarch Research is creating? And that, of course, is establishing native plants on your land. The third one, a more advanced session. Jim will be back for that one as well, but he will be hosting the master gardeners uh, who, of course, will help all of us, ongoing, all of us in the county uh, to do more advanced planning, to do polyscaping where we're trying to create beautiful images with native plants and the like. Ah, uh, the next one. This one brings back memories because this is how Marion Clark started in this environmental endeavor. We reared four or five monarchs that, that Cam Watts uh, shared eggs and caterpillars with us, which we reared these to adult uh, monarchs on our back patio. Mike Martin has a kit. Everyone on this call can get a kit and rear four or five monarchs. For a lot of people, it's a life-changing experience. And then in addition to that, advanced techniques in rearing, Cam Watts is gonna do that with the tent, the bio tent, and actually rearing several hundred uh, monarchs at a time. So the picture that you saw of me with the sun coming up, the engine that powers life on the planet, well, the humans have, have been a, a unprecedented force uh, in altering the planet, uh, and it's doing it at staggering rates. I mean, in years, not decades, not centuries, years. And to that end, uh, my computer just is a little flaky this morning. To that end, humans have altered 75% of the Earth's terrestrial surface. How has it done that? Um, well, how have humans affected the Earth's surface? The Earth's surface has been covered with plants, native plants, and they've been disturbed. They've been removed. And the majority of time, they were not replaced. Now, what this causes is a domino effect a domino effect to all life on the planet. Now to understand that, we need to zoom in to this relationship. We need to understand how life actually exists on our planet. Well, it exists first and foremost because of the sun. The sun's energy, is 99% of all energy required to run 
our planet and life on our planet. And the way that sun's energy gets to us is, is two ways. Infrared light heating the planet, and then white light, which is being absorbed by our plant life. This energy is being absorbed by our plant life and transformed into green plants, more green plants. In, in fact, it's trapping the energy from the sun. Now, the energy that runs the rest of the uh, uh, life on the planet, the animal kingdom specifically, all comes from plants. Energy transfer, it transfers, well, first and foremost to our insect population that's, that's mired right in the middle of this habitat, and then all the way up, all the way up to us. The two key elements in this drawing, the sun and the native plants that you see at the bottom of the pyramid. Now we know what happens when this gets disrupted, when these plants are removed, because the milkweed plant was removed. And what happened? Well, there happens to be one animal that depends on milkweed. It's the only plant it can uh, uh, have its life cycle on. So when milkweed goes, the monarch goes. And you can see this is an actual trend line of the population for the last 30 years as measured annually. And you can see the trend line is not good. So that isn't good news. But the really bad news is that the monarch isn't alone. It's one of a million species at risk today on the planet. Okay, so let's continue with the insects. If we're removing the plants, what's happening to the insect world? Well, the windshield effect. Now today you're gonna get numbers and facts, but many of these things are observations that you're able to make yourself. The windshield effect. You capture flying insects on your windshield don't you? Okay. Well, so the flying insects are part of the whole insect group, which is 80% of all of the species in the animal kingdom. Okay. <laughs> we, we haven't been respecting insects very much, but I hope after you see that it represents 80% of all species on the planet, you'll recognize that insects are hugely important. And the flying insects are a subset, and they include pollinators. And pollinators are animals that actually allow 200,000 plants to reproduce. We're talking about the bees, the moths, the butterflies, the flies, and so on and so forth. So pollinators are really important and that's what's being smashed on our windshield that when we drive at high speed. If you've monitored this over the last 10, 15 years, you'll know it's changed dramatically. Mary and I used to have to use an ice scraper to clean our windshield back 10, 20 years ago. That's not the case anymore. Uh, so, one country, only one country, has been running measurements on the loss of flying insects, and it's Germany. Germany is highlighted in National Geographic with a front page story this week because their longitudinal study, the last 30 years, have indicated that Germany has lost 78% of their flying in 78% of their pollinators in 30 years. Okay. This has been a wake-up call. This information was released in 2015. And believe me, it was a wake-up call for our entomologists. So uh, 
I mentioned National Geographic, so I'll skip over that. What's happening worldwide with insects? 27% have been lost in 30 years. Worldwide, 1% each year. Now, in geologic time, a year is nothing. A century is nothing. The Earth's been here for 4 billion years. We are losing 1% of our insects each year. So, Iowa, is it better than the national, than the global average? Unfortunately not. We have actually disturbed more of our soil than 75%, especially in Iowa. So, 4% per loss per year is unsustainable. That means we do need to take action. So, specialized relationships are another thing we need to know about what's happened to the plants that have been removed from Earth's surface. There are certain plants that are absolutely required for certain animals, a special relationship. And when that plant, like the milkweed, disappears, the, the animal that's dependent on it disappears too. Okay, so are there other situations like this? Yes, it's the rule between plant and animal kingdom that these relationships are everywhere. Here is the, the Midwestern sunflower. When it disappears, well, 13 bee species disappear. Now, we have an expert on special relationships, and he certainly could have covered the areas that I already covered, but he is a specialist on the effect of insects and the loss of those insects on our bird population. So we've moved up the pyramid, loss of plants, loss of insects. Well, how is that moving up the pyramid? How is it affecting the bird population? Dr. Tallamy was here last year and, and delighted 500 residents of Lynn County. He will be back this year in October. You don't want to miss him when he comes back. So this is a little teaser, but it also give you some information that you might not know today. Let's watch. So specialized relationships involving insects are the rule in the natural world rather than the exception, and they always start with plants. But there are a number of animals that depend on the specialized relationships that insects have with plants. Uh, and we're gonna give you a few examples of that. I'm gonna talk about the Carolina chickadee because we have studied it quite a bit. We have a lot of data on Carolina chickadees. You have black capped chickadees here, but they're doing almost the same thing. They're, they're, you can, can't even tell them apart when you look at them. So um, just, we'll just call them chickadees. And the first thing we, we think about chickadees is that they're the most common bird at our feeders. So they're seed eaters, they're, they're eating away. But when it comes time to reproduce, and this is something most people don't know, the birds cannot use seed to rear their young. They're rearing their young on insects, and they really like caterpillars. And if they're in a, an environment with a lot of caterpillars, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. Uh, and when you look across the terrestrial bird uh, uh, species, you find out that that is not an exception. Most birds are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars are transferring more energy up the food web to other animals than any other type of insect and probably any other type of, of animals. That makes caterpillars really important. Plants capture energy from the sun, but if it doesn't pass up the food, if it doesn't leave the plant, in other words, if something doesn't eat that plant, the energy is locked up there and they might, might as well not have captured it. Okay. Uh, I was very surprised when I learned how important caterpillars are to birds. I always thought it was seeds and berries, which it is. But for them to reproduce, they have to have caterpillars. 
And the keystone tree in our area is the native oak tree. Now there's all kinds of plants that caterpillars feed on besides trees. Uh, but the oak tree is particularly important because it supports 527 different species of caterpillars. Caterpillars eat the leaf on the oak tree and the energy from the sun is transferred to the caterpillar, which is eventually transferred to the moth or butterfly. This is a native oak tree and native caterpillars have learned to feed off the native oak tree. But many of us have planted non-native trees on our property. Oh, in mass, our nurseries most of the time don't even talk about whether a tree is native or not because humans haven't worried about whether or not they had caterpillars. In fact, they didn't want caterpillars because they might eat the leaf on the tree. How absurd is that now that we understand the significance of these caterpillars? Zero caterpillars supported by the ginkgo tree. And what's happening to our bird population? Well, you could guess, uh, through, we have lost 3 billion birds in North America alone in the last 50 years. And we don't need these numbers to tell us that. We know, we have seen birds diminishing at our feeders. And of course, if we don't have caterpillars on our property, we don't have any nesting of birds going on on our property. So let's review. Quickly, humans disturb 75% of the Earth's surface, removing the native plants jeopardizing the animal kingdom. Ah, uh, the energy pyramid. No plants, no energy, no life on the planet. And finally, specialized relationships. We not only need plants, we need native plants. Native animals need native plants. Okay, it's time to stop and take a few questions. And let's see what we have for questions. Okay. How can I tell if my plants and trees are native? Great question. All, all the way through this series, we're gonna be providing information on our website that, that supports what we are talking about. So we'll have information about, um, uh, in fact, provided by Dr. Tellamy, uh, about the native plants. And more importantly, he'll put an asterisk by the keystone, the important native plants, like the oak tree. Can I just stop mowing my ditch? Will native plants come back? Well, uh, yes, uh, they may come back, uh, but more than likely, there'll be few native plants that come back if they can compete with the non-native plants that you have in the ditch. Non-native plants become invasive because nothing is feeding on those non-native plants. So the best thing is you can let your ditch, uh, uh, stop mowing your ditch. It won't look very good. So what we need to do is have a long-term plan to change those ditches in the native plants. How about, uh, can this be taken to schools? Uh, kids, can kids hear about this? <laughs> you bet. And, and uh, we are working uh, a hand in glove with the, the school systems, the colleges and K through 12. Uh, and it's, it's very important that this younger generation be presented with this information. You see, us adults weren't even aware of most of these things five years ago. We weren't aware of it. So we didn't do anything about it. And we, we are the problem. So we can't let that happen with our kids. So 
Monarch Research will actually be doing these webinars in customized formats for businesses that want their employees engaged in this planning forward movement for schools uh, uh, and uh, for just landowners across the state. We'll continue these all the way through the summer. Well, let's get back. And I promised uh, 45 minutes, so let's get back and uh, finish our presentation. Ah, now we need to move into some action. And Dr. Tellum is gonna to talk to us about creating living landscapes. What you're looking at right here in this picture is a dead zone. We have it everywhere. We have it in our schools, we have it at our corporate campuses. We have mowed grass. This is not native habitat. It does nothing for the insect population. But let's let an expert talk about it. So think of the plants uh, in, in your yard as if they are bird feeders. There you go, they're bird feeders. Now you get to decide how well you're gonna feed the birds. You can feed them a lot, or you can feed them just a little bit. This is what the landscapes around me look like. Giant lawns with almost no plants at all. You can put food in your bird feeders, put those plants that are making a lot of caterpillars out there, or you can keep them empty. There's a ginkgo back there. It's a big tree, but it's not making any food. And that's because we've fallen into the trap of thinking that, that plants are just decorations. And we fell into that trap because they are decorations, they're beautiful. It's very easy to decorate our landscapes with it. So when we go to the nursery, we buy something that's pretty. Maybe it can be a screen or an anchor or focal point, but it's all been about aesthetics. No thought to the ecological role that those plants must start playing at home. And when we, we choose our plants strictly based on what they're looking like, then landscaping equals ecological destruction. That's beautiful, but it is not a functional ecosystem. But we could find pretty plants that perform all the, the ecosystem services that we humans desperately need everywhere. They could support those food webs, they could store carbon, protect our watersheds, create complex pollinator habitats, complex natural enemy communities, all the things we need them to do. And when we choose plants based at least partially on their ecological function, then landscape, e landscaping equals ecological restoration. And I think this is, this is the future. This is 21st century landscaping here. We've done 20th century landscaping. It hasn't worked. We're now in the sixth grade extinction. So let's give this a try and see if we can, can pull out of that. This is typically what we ask our caterpillars to live in. Nobody's measured how successful that is, but this is what we ought to be doing. We ought to be building layered landscapes. So here's the tree, the caterpillar falls out. There's a, a native uh, azalea there, and we've got ferns and ground covers, a totally safe site for them to complete their development in. This is where you can do your, your fancy spring ephemeral gardening. You're not gonna go tramping through that, and you're certainly not gonna mow it. The caterpillars will love you. Creating pollinator zones. So it's pretty simple. Uh, we can recognize that uh, the ground uh, on the top of the slide is really not performing any ecological function. It's, it's not in the uh, ecosystem. It's a dead zone. The lower picture is a living landscape. So public land, and private land. Small pieces of land, large pieces of land. You're going to find as we go through this that they all count. But let's look uh, a little further at public land first because that's not land that you are necessarily responsible for. But Monarch Research has been working on it very hard. And we've met with our government officials, county and city, and Believe me, they're all in. We have great local people. This community is a great community and a community that can solve these issues. And we started with public land and we went to uh, uh, the parks and recreation people uh, in Cedar Rapids and quickly moved to the county uh, folks uh, and uh, Marion and we developed a plan with all three involved where those officials, they agreed to converting a thousand acres 
of unproductive ground into habitat, if we, that being the people who support the Monarch Research Project through their donations, would cover their out-of-pocket costs for seed, some tractors, and things like that. The Thousand Acre Plan was so revolutionizing in 2017 that a scientific journal picked up on it and ran a story about Lynn Count, Cedar Rapids, and Marion. It had 78 million views. Okay, so you can see we're already in a leadership role where we're setting an example for other communities around the country. And we hope we can extend the thousand acre plan to 2000 acres. This will again be covered by donations to the Monarch Research Project for the people in Lynn County. What other targets do we have for unproductive ground? Well, <laughs> huge area, all the roadside ditches, and they are very difficult to replant. They're dead zones today. They have uh, weeds, grass, non-native plants galore. So it's not an easy task and nobody's really tackled it in the way that Lynn County is. Lynn County Engineering, Lynn County Roads, in other words, have partnered with us in, in this project. And the Monarch Research Project has taken the front end of this project and Lynn County Roads will handle the back end of the project, public-private partnership. We're going to plant a thousand miles of mini prairies across Lynn County. But before we go into depth on that one, let's go back to parks and trails because this is something that you and your family can enjoy this spring and summer and fall, different flowers at each season of the year. Watch this family, the Gibbons family enjoy our new uh, native plants in our parks. So I skipped over the slide going into that uh, because I wanted to keep our, our timeline tight today. Uh, but we have completed this year, we will complete the thousand acre plan and look forward to doing another thousand acres. But let's now zoom in to the rights of way. Thousand mile pilot is what Monarch Research established. And that would be uh, along the 1,100 miles of Lynn County roads. Now, 
I mentioned how difficult it is to plant in these, these ditches. It's hard to even walk in the ditches, let alone plant native plants. So we had to create some new technology. The vehicle that you see here is called the SAT, the Swiss Army Truck. And we created this vehicle so one person could operate this vehicle and mow, spray, and seed without ever leaving the truck. And as a result, we tested this this year and we did the first 200 miles. Now, uh, that's not the end of the story and you're gonna learn next week with Jim Hoffman that preparing is really important and seeding, but managing it for the first three or four years after it's planted is very important. Lynn County Roads will be managing and manicuring those mini prairies. And what will we have at the end of five years? Well, hopefully we'll have a thousand miles of new habitat that are continuous and to, uh, totally covering, blanketing the county. The beauty of this is for flying insects, they can move from these mini prairies all the way across our county, especially the monarch butterfly. What will we have at the end of the five years? Well, we will have planted 75,000 mini prairies. Mini prairies, much like what you're gonna be able to put on your own land. So speaking of your own land, let's talk about private land. Now, the main thrust is gonna be next week, but I'll give you a little insight. Uh, we need to create pollinator zones, zones of native plants as broadly across the state, uh, across the county as we can. The Tellamy challenge is to identify the unproductive land that you are responsible for and over a period of time transform it into native plants, native trees, a new oak tree. Who should be doing this? All landowners, in town, out of town, urban, rural, everyone needs to do this. Because you see, if all you have done with your land is put it into mowed grass, you've actually removed your land from the ecosystem. And if your neighbor does that, and your next neighbor does that, pretty soon, we don't have an ecosystem anymore, right? So, in fact, when you think of, of urban areas, it's a lot less pesticides, herbicides floating around in an urban area. They're going to be really good for our insect population. So, how are we gonna do this? How can you register and bring your ground back into the ecosystem? We're going to register. This is a brand new program. We're going to register 5,000 of you landowners in this planning forward movement. 5,000 over the next five years. That would be about 25% of all the landowners in our county. Can we do it? I know we can do it. Uh, once people understand, what we're doing here, they're gonna join. And education is the first key. If we had known all the things that we talked about today, we would have started this process years ago. And action doesn't do any good to point fingers at other people for not doing it. We gotta energize each other to take action. And Monarch Research will equip you. We'll equip you with the educational piece. You're gonna provide the energy and the equipment. Well, 
we'll provide seed for your first mini prairie if you've prepared your ground as required to be part of the, the program and become a pollinator zone. So, tell me challenge, uh, we need to convert uh, this land uh, that you see in front of you. These are dead zones. We need to change our whole attitude about our landscape. We need to create living landscapes. Dr. Talamy sums it up. This ecosystem is dependent on what happens locally and we can fix it. We can't do it alone. We have to do it with our friends and our neighbors. We have to do it as a community. This is not something that the federal government fixes for us. We own the land. We have the responsibility to register it back into the ecosystem. So to review, uh, living landscapes, let's convert as much as we can. Uh, pollinator zones, they can be everywhere. Parks, trails, roadsides, uh, homes, businesses, churches, you name it. And you need to help us. You are going to be some founding members registering as some of the first pollinator zones in the group of 5,000. We need to get to it in five years. Our presentation today will probably be given to several thousand landowners this season. So q and I'd like to take some more time for Q&A, but the problem is I've used up our time and we have a lot of questions to, to answer for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all the questions and we're going to provide them to you probably sometime tomorrow. So planning forward, lessons learned. We've done it individually. We've done it on our own property and we've created a very serious situation for the animal kingdom. We've removed native plants. So step two in the process, once we realize what we've done, is we need to take dead zones and turn them into living landscapes. The only way they're living landscapes and can be registered as part of our ecosystem if they're native landscapes, native trees and native plants. So, This was not a free seminar today. You owe us. You owe us your comments. Wouldn't it be great if we could get 100% of the people on this call to fill in a questionnaire and tell us what you thought. Other than my bumbling fingers, tell us what you thought about the, the program. Did it get you fired up to take action? And are you signed up for next week's session? This is the real action. This is where your excitement about fixing this problem locally can be put into action. Step by step, you can become part of the 5,000 that we're gonna sign up. Can you imagine the attention we're gonna get nationally? If we have 5,000 of our landowners in one county sign up as a pollinator zone, more important than our publicity is the fact that other communities are gonna to wanna to follow suit. And the way that's gonna happen is it's gotta be viral, okay? It can't be just me, it can't be just you, it's got to be you going to two or three of your friends and neighbors and convincing them they need to participate in this program. And they can actually review what we covered today by going to our website, monarchresearch.org, monarchresearch.org. You're going to get lots of other information on that website. 
but they, you can go to it and review what you saw today, but you can have your neighbors review it, okay? Once they've done that, they need to sign up for Jim's session next week. Can you help us? It's got to go viral within, within Lynn County. We need 5,000 landowners. Let's get back to this picture, which is the engine for all life on the planet. It takes time to restore the plants that we have removed. We're calling this planting forward because what we plant today is going to be the most significant gift we can give to our kids, our grandkids, to the next generation. Help us out. Take the responsibility for your own land and take responsibility for helping to secure other landowners to join the movement. This has been great, getting, being able to come into your home this morning. I wanna thank you for attending and hope to see you back next week.